A nation can survive its fools, and even the ambitious, but it cannot survive treason from within. They've been wrong about the wars, they've been wrong about jobs, they've been wrong about everything. The question is, are they stupid or do they have a plan? I actually think for the most part, they have a plan, but some are not too smart. Welcome to the Horrible Deplorable Show, the anti-globalist, America First program dedicated to de-hoaxing the media and destroying the narrative. Here's your host, the founder and editor of The Daily Stir, Matt Wingard. Welcome to the Horrible Deplorable Show. I'm Matt Wingard, and with me as always is my good friend Doris. Hello, Doris. Hello, Matt. I want to welcome the Gab community who's listening and let remind you that you can always find this episode and previous episodes of The Horrible Deplorable Show on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Pocket Cast, and other apps. We play on the weekends on the405media.com at 5 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday. If you like the show, please press the like button on your app and share us with a friend. We had a terrorist attack in New York City this week. It's become a pretty regular feature now of Europe and the United States to have these terrorist attacks. They have, uh, clearly ISIS has instructed members to use the vehicles because it's the easiest thing to go and rent and to have access to pedestrians is pretty easy. So you can kill, in Nice it was like 86 and uh, it was eight in New York. They keep trying to, you know, the garbage mainstream media has got their frame that they want to constantly put all these things in you know when it's the Vegas shooter they immediately want to talk about gun control and how there's a disproportionate of white men who are these mass shooters which turns out not to be true but anyway that's the narrative that they want to sell but the moment we have like our 100th or our 200th Muslim terrorist the first thing they want to talk about is this the potential backlash. I know that the Muslim community is bracing for a backlash like that's your very first concern first of all it doesn't happen There are no pitchfork mobs that go after the Muslim community, which, frankly, at this point is almost startling to me how patient and forgiving Americans have been that there aren't some wackos out there going on rampages is actually incredible to me, which shows me that it's the exact opposite of the narrative of America that the the garbage mainstream media constantly wants to portray. But we basically have uh, two types of attacks that are occurring, sometimes in combination. Sometimes they come out of the vehicle shooting, so we get both. But usually it's um, either, you know, get some guns, go into a place like a bar or a concert and because you have the crowds together and, and shoot as many people dead as you possibly can before you yourself are killed. Or get a vehicle like a truck. It's got to be something heavy because you're going to be running people down and you can't do that in a Prius. So they get some kind of large truck, get a lot of speed going, mow down pedestrians or people at a farmer's market or wherever you can find people in public gathered. And then oftentimes what's added on top of that is is once the vehicle has come to a stop or crash, jump out with a weapon and shoot some more people and yelling at Alu Akbar until you are killed or taken by the police. Yeah, so how are these people that rent these trucks going to deal with this, or are they? Let's talk of profiling Muslim men who are renting, that's going to get nothing but pushback in our PC culture. But I'm not sure. You know, again, this is the whole point about immigration and allowing, you know, millions of Muslims to immigrate into the country is you create a a nesting place for a certain, if albeit small, percentage of second, third generation Muslims who get radicalized to go out and do this killing. And they are in your free country, you know, and you can put up, I mean, there's this, I was talking to Doris about this idea that there was a phrase from a year or two ago hurled at the Germans and others in Europe that if you won't build walls at your border, you're going to have to build walls around your buildings. And it's turned out to be true. They won't patrol their immigration system. They won't keep a flood of immigrants from coming from outside of Europe. So now there are these pictures all over the internet of the kinds of cement barricades they have to put up around farmers markets, any public gathering, their most important and significant buildings. So they have to end up putting a bunch of barricades up 
but they do them internally rather than externally around the outside of the country. So the idea that you don't need walls is ludicrous. Even they apparently understand that. Now it's just a debate about where are you going to build these walls. For example, in my community, they just built a new school, and there's these big round posts. What are they called? Bullards or something like that to keep vehicles from crashing into the school. That's just one example. So we have to constantly give up our freedoms inside the country and live behind buildings and go to public events that are barricaded and that are heavy in security because we won't get smart and realistic about our immigration system and the idea that just taking one person from every country in the world is not some diversity panacea. You're inviting a lot of different cultures into your country. It's about the rate at which you're doing that. You know, it's one thing to take one Muslim every 10 years versus, say, 100,000 Muslims every year. Those are two different things. One Muslim can be assimil assimilated. 100,000 Muslims, if they're, especially if they're going to live together, you're creating enclaves. And yes, we had Italian and Irish and other enclaves before, but it, again, if you don't think those enclaves didn't change the country, you don't know your history. So waves of immigration change the country, period. Now, I'm not suggesting that's always bad. I am just suggesting that they change the country. So when you get a wave of Irish immigrants, that has an effect. It changes the wash -ish culture. And then because they're Catholic, so there's obviously a change there. Then you get Italians, Eastern Europeans. It changes the culture. When you have a number of Central Americans coming in over the course of many decades, it changes the culture. You'll notice that you hear Spanish a lot more. So what do you think happens when you suddenly import a couple of million Muslims into your country? Yeah. It doesn't just increase membership at the Quilters Club. It increases their power of what they want our America to be. And as always, you're going to have enclaves and you're going to have an effect on the country. And then there's this reflexive desire to simply make excuses about everything. All cultures are equal. And that's not even the left narrative. The left narrative is, is that European culture is worse, even though that's demonstrably opposite of the truth. All they want to do is it's like a free fire zone to pick on Western culture. But how dare you make any assessment negative assessments about other cultures meanwhile you know you've got muslim countries where gays are being thrown off roofs and women are forced to wear the full burqa hijab you know they cannot i mean only their eyes are showing and where's the feminist outrage on that well you know president trump said that he's going to terminate america's green card diversity program but that, they think he'll need the support of Congress for that. And can you imagine them doing that? Well, they're, they're a bunch of cowards. They've had a bill sitting, uh, waiting to go for almost a year, apparently, that they haven't moved on. I doubt whether this creates enough impetus for them to get it done. One thing it does do, though, is begin to change the overall conversation about, it affects the conversation about any kind of immigration bill that eventually moves. They're never going to be able to move a DACA amnesty bill by itself. And part of what happens when you get a terrorist attack like this is this idea of ending the diversity lottery becomes another element in the debate of any kind of a comprehensive immigration reform package. Just as the RAISE Act was introduced and Trump is now ha hammering away on this idea of ending cha chain migration because those things are going to have to be part of any deal. And I don't think the Democrats or even a lot of the Chamber of Commerce Republicans want any kind of deal where they dramatically change the immigration system. So the only upside to that is, well, there's a couple upsides. One is, is that DACA, I don't think, passes then because it's going to have to be wrapped into these kinds of major changes in the immigration system. And if the other side isn't willing to compromise, then DACA is just simply going to expire and people are going to get deported. The other upside is, and I've said this before on the podcast, is the president has all the advantages in this. The law allows him to crack down on all of this and to ramp up deportation, something I wish that he would do a lot more of. There needs to be a lot more deportations. But in you know, this is the best bargaining chip he has, is that the longer they wait to come up with a compromise, the more he can simply exert pressure by saying, I'm just going to deport and deport and deport and crack down on all of this while you're twiddling your thumbs, moving everything politically in his direction. Because the more he deports, the less there's the fight about. You know, a really good example is chain migration is our newest terrorist had what, like 23 people that had followed him into the country because he was a citizen? 
Yeah, that uh, diversity lottery has allowed a million people in just since 2005. It was created by Ted Kennedy and Chuck Schumer, which is why you can see he's being kind of defensive about the whole thing. And worst of all, uh, the New York prosecutors have charged our newest terrorist with criminal actions rather than as an enemy combatant. If they had charged him as an enemy combatant, he would have been subject to military trial. Instead, American taxpayers are going to have to pay to defend this murderer. There's an interesting twist on this. So about a day or two before the attack, down in the Virginia governor's race, which is the next one that's sort of going to, I think the election's next week, so it's almost finished. Ed Gillespie run against, running as the Republican for governor. And the Latino Victory Fund, who knows, I'm sure radical leftists, put out an ad, really despicable ad, it's about a minute long, that shows this white truck with an Ed Gillespie bumper sticker and a Confederate flag flying, basically trying to run down a bunch of minority kids. One girl who's clearly Muslim, the others are Hispanic, and it suggests that somehow they're going to be deported or perhaps they're just going to be run down by this truck, and it ends with the one kid who's being chased waking up it had all been a nightmare in his bed and this is really despicable ad that has absolutely nothing to do with ed gillespie but so a couple of things happen first of all within about 48 hours this attack occurs in new york and so while they were trying to portray the idea that somehow white people are running down brown people in trucks what actually happened within 48 hours was that a brown person was running down white people in a truck. So they pulled the ad because I think they realized that, uh, as usual, just with all, like, it's the same with all of these hate crime hoaxes. We just, there was all this uh, Nazi swastika graffiti going up in San Francisco, and it turns out it's a black man they've arrested for doing it. They've got him on film. So 99% of these hate crime, swastikas, nooses, and all the rest that go up around college campuses and black churches and whether they're all almost to an example. They're all hate crime hoaxes done by Democrats, minorities, people trying to drive the narrative rather than the truth of the thing. And reality, by the way, has absolutely no effect on the left. It, I, I guarantee you no one on the left saw the irony in what happened two days later in New York from that ad that I'm sure they were cheering on. And they'll go right back to thinking, they'll never stop thinking in their warped frame, even though Alu Akbar keeps happening and the, the terrorist attacks keep happening. They, they will not change course. We've already had so many people murdered by now that to any thinking human being by now understands that there is a problem within the Muslim community of extremism radical Islam motivating people to mass murder. And the fact that there's just this entire loony left that discards that, believes it's not even an issue worth addressing, and it immediately wants to turn it into, oh my gosh, this is going to create a, a pitchforked mob that's going to be ransacking Muslim neighborhoods and hanging people by the nearest trees and all of that, and, and they're going to be driven into the sea by angry Americans, something that isn't, it's just a joke. It's just a joke, but can't address the problem at all. And then I, you know, I saw when that ad came out, before the attack, when the ad came out in Virginia, I thought, well, that's desperate. And the ad's so over the top that I felt like it was a sign the Democrats thought they were going to lose in that race. Because when you throw up something that, it's kind of a Hail Mary pass, a desperate ad like that. It's, I think it's a tremendous sign of weakness. So now we find out that not only will the Democrat candidate not disavow the ad, but he's reversed course on sanctuary cities and announced that he opposes sanctuary cities. If that doesn't tell you that their internal polling is disastrous for them, I think at this point it... I haven't seen any polling. Both sides are claiming to have polling that shows them winning. But just from looking at these kind of desperate maneuvers from the Democrat, I suspect that Ed Gillespie is going to win that race. So what are we really left with? We're left with the average American having to be hyper vigilant and suspicious of people around them in everyday life. Well, it's a natural result, you know, result of people who have their own agenda. For instance, you know, where are most of these Muslim communities? There's one in uh, Minnesota, and I, I believe there's one somewhere in the Midwest. It's not like most of the wealthy Democrats who advocate for these policies because they want the cheap maid or the cheap nanny. They don't, they're not living right next to a, a foreign community 
in this case, let's talk, you know, we're talking about a Muslim community that might pose any kind of threat to them. A lot of them live behind gated communities. Most Americans have begun to pretty severely segregate into entire, you know, we have upper class cities and we have lower class cities. So even within a metro area, wealthy people tend to congregate in a couple of neighborhoods and they, they're already locking themselves away. And they, so for them, they see this only basically from a labor standpoint. They want all that cheap labor because they don't feel like any of those people are going to compete against them for jobs. And then also, it just is this sort of, again, it's this cloud city mentality of this sort of feel-good Hollywood myth that somehow everything, you know, everyone out there is the same. All cultures are equal except for ours, which is worse, obviously. And that there's this, you know, there there is a, a myth that's created by Hollywood over many decades, and we've seen it in television and movies. And it's this kind of kumbaya myth that some, you know, that, and it's you see it in the television shows where everything's resolved within an hour. Problems are quickly resolved. The back in the olden days, the shows with the parents, the children would have problems or they'd have a fight, but everything would get wrapped up neatly, and everyone would say what they needed to say and get it off their chest, and then they'd be hugging it out by the end. And there is this general myth that gets perpetuated that it all kind of works out, and that all of the and what goes what accompanies this diversity model is this idea that everybody is just the same and that we just look a little different because of melatonin or or maybe we have different religions there's maybe some slight cultural differences but that everything's just exactly the same that and you can put all of these kids you know if you put them in a in a kindergarten or something that they're all just the same child and you have these people in the cloud cities who who get a lot of their information about society from what they watch on the television. And so they just have this image constantly reinforced that it will just all work out if you if everybody sits down over a meal and talks it out. Like all we have to do is love one another and it will solve all the problems. Well, I've talked about this in a previous podcast. Just don't listen to John Lennon's song Imagine. Go online and just read the lyrics. A lot of times, you know, a song can be very pretty to listen to, but I mean, a lot of times, if you sit down and read the lyrics, they're misogynist or pretty disgusting in one way or another. Part of why I would suggest something like read Imagine's lyrics is that you get the full subtext of what's being sort of pushed on you if you just read the lyrics without the nice song that is sort of the cherry flavoring that's meant to help the medicine go down and it's the same thing when we talk about what's going on in a lot of television shows where you're constantly having these liberal ideas foisted on you they'll package it in a cop show or a court or a a murder mystery or some kind of an action adventure or a fantasy and that is the cherry flavoring the sort of romantic story that's designed to pull you in and give you a good ride for an hour but there's usually a subtext underneath we were just watching the blacklist the other night doris and i and in the middle of a normal blacklist story which usually doesn't have a much a bunch of politics we got a lecture on black lives matter suddenly the whole thing detoured into a black lives matter lecture before it moved on it was a little overt which is why doris and i were kind of laughing at it but a lot of times that's more subtle and and placed into the storyline so Again, these very left-leaning writers are trying to combine entertaining you with channeling you. So the next time you watch a show or go to a movie, look for these things. If you open your eyes to all this political crap that's going on, you'll see it everywhere. Even your favorite shows do it to you. And those of us who don't want to give up totally on some of this entertainment because I do like some of these shows, I just I've learned to train myself to see it. I think a lot of people try to train themselves to ignore it. I think that's a mistake because the more you're ignoring a subtext or a subliminal message, the more it's actually working on you. Embedded. Right. Mm -hmm. So I try to make a habit out of recognizing when it's happening, but then just not dwelling on it. Like, oh, I see that you're going to, this is now a Black Lives Matter lecture. If you recognize it in that way, it has very little power over you, especially if you ridicule it, which is what Doris and I usually do. For example, on This Is Us, which is one of the most popular shows on TV, they are able to present different points of view and to have the multiculturalism in there without you resenting it. You forget about the colors on that show. 
I don't know. I don't know. I think that uh, there have been moments. It's much more subtle. I would say that, you know, that's the art of what leftists do is that some leftists just aren't that good at this. And so it's more like a sledgehammer as we experienced in that Blacklist episode. But I just, I, you know, the writers of This Is Us are just as left. And what I can see is, is that they're better writers. And so the social justice warring themes, they're more subtle. They're much more subtle in there, but they're still there. And I try to be aware of when that stuff is happening. You have to be hyper vigilant to it, or it's going to wash over you. So the man, uh, Manafort was indicted by Robert Mueller this last week. I don't think there's a tremendous amount of surprise there. The left was hyperventilating about it, but I think it still appears to be a house of cards. One thing we've learned is just what I said, which is the guy's on a total witch hunt. And he's way off his mandate. He's told to investigate Russian interference. And what he is charging Manafort with is money laundering and things having to do with Ukraine and perhaps Russian influence on that years ago before the 2016 campaign. So he's way, way off his mandate, which is entirely predictable. The other thing I would point out is that they're, they're going to have a hard time making the money laundering issue stick because if your income is legal technically then it can't be money laundering because money laundering has to do with illegal income oh but they're going to get him the irs is going to get him for not reporting they the may income. but that's not but the point is they've charged him with money laundering so they're going to have a hard time making that stick when he can prove that he was legally working for these entities this was not illegal drug running profits that kind of stuff i also saw that tony podesta which was the firm that was heavily involved in this lobbying firm that Manafort, I believe, had the relationship with. Tony Podesta has resigned from that lobbying firm and appears to be worried. I, I think that this is not a straight line to the Trump administration. It's actually a straight line right into the D.C. swamp and especially a lot of Clinton cronies and, and lobbyists and the rest. I also saw that... First of all, you're hearing, you're probably hearing out there about social media outfits like Twitter and Facebook all saying that they've identified all these accounts that were Russian accounts during the election. First of all, there's a tremendous amount of lying going on there because they have a very broad definition. They are including any account that, that occasionally tweeted in Russian. So basically, if a person used the Russian language in their Twitter account, they get identified as a Russian account having influence on the election by these outfits. So they have a very ludicrous wide net drawing in all this crap. The kinds of numbers they're talking about, they, Facebook, I think, was claiming that $100,000 had been spent in advertising by all these accounts, which is like a tiny amount. It's like a fractional amount. It means nothing. Get and you a couple of radio ads. It, well, this is Facebook advertising. Yeah, I understand, but even still. It's just it's just ludicrous. I mean, the more you get down into the details of what these social media companies, these giant big tech companies are claiming, it's a nothing burger. It's a giant nothing burger. And then it turns out that some of these Russian accounts were used to encourage people to protest the Trump administration during the transition. So when we saw those large crowds gathering outside Trump Tower, there were some of these identified Russian accounts that were the ones that were massively retweeted that encouraged people to turn out for those events. Rut row, that doesn't exactly fit the narrative of the Russians trying to help get Trump elected. It, it's just a house, um, to use a bad pun right now in another subject we're going to get to, it's a house of cards. The whole thing just stinks because of the stupid way that Sessions was forced to recuse himself, and then it's never been adequately explained to me why Robert Mueller needed to be hired to do an independent counsel, when everything we know about James Comey now shows that he should have been fired ten times. I think that Trump has been absolutely validated in his firing of James Comey, and yet somehow that resulted in Robert Mueller being given the task of an independent counsel, and yet he has not managed to shed much light on the mandate he was given, which was seeking information about Russian interference in the 2016 election. And said he suddenly, after millions of dollars spent, he's got these indictments 
of Manafort and Manafort's co-worker on things that were pre the election have absolutely nothing to do with what he was asked to. Meanwhile, we're getting leaks and information about the dossier, that false phony Trump dossier that was created using some MI6 guy out of the UK that McCain was involved in and Free Bacon and maybe uh, Paul Singer, the billionaire, was involved in funding when it was a Republican hit job against Trump, and then it got turned over after he won the nomination. It got taken over by the DNC and Hillary Clinton. They've all admitted that they helped to pay for that now, and that that's when this guy was brought on and all this phony crap was put into the dossier. All of that's coming out, and where's Mueller on all that? I mean, this is the stuff that actually pertains to Russian interference in the 2016 election, and Robert Mueller and his multi-million dollar team, mostly of Clinton hacks, they're not responsible for getting any of that information out. It's a lawsuit that's driving a lot of that to come out. He is totally off his mandate while important information is coming out, which he seems to have no interest in because he has some connection to Fusion GPS, which is the firm that was hired to do this, and he's off on a witch hunt on stuff, you know, bringing prosecutions against guys. And I don't really care whether Manafort did this or not and that they're going to get him on on failure, failure to report income to the IRS or what have you. But the point is, is that has absolutely nothing to do with Russian interference in the 2016 election. None, zero, zilch. So I've said from the beginning he ought to fire the guy. I don't care if all of the elite heads in Washington, D.C. will explode. But the whole thing's just a cluster. And it's certainly not harming the president. It's making everyone involved in it, including Mueller, look terrible. He needs to wrap it up. It's a tremendous waste of money. I see that Antifa plans to be in the streets in a few days on November 4th, uh, some kind of massive protest against Trump. This is a domestic terrorist outfit as far as I'm concerned. I find it interesting that when a couple hundred white nationalists rally in Charlottesville, that is the rise of the Nazis and the whole country must come to a standstill and, and it's literally end of the world stuff. And then they held another rally, apparently in Tennessee, where there were maybe a couple dozen of them. And this, again, a lot of the mainstream media outfits out of New York sent correspondence there because that absolutely had to be covered. And what's going to happen in a couple of days is, is that tens of thousands, probably, of Antifa radicals who have a long history of violence against people and against property in the last few years... They're going to show their faces all over, and there aren't going to be massive counter-protests to shout them down and drown them out, and there isn't going to be uh, a huge attack by the mainstream media about the kind of threat that these folks pose. And yet the numbers and the just level of hate and the actual physical threat that these folks are, are going to pose in the next few days is going to dwarf anything coming out of a handful of white nationalists. But again... This is about the Overton window and controlling the narrative, right? So a handful of white nationalists who are basically pizza delivery boys, they can be, by the mainstream media, pumped up into this massive threat to the United States. Meanwhile, the constant Muslim attacks who've now claimed hundreds, thousands of lives in the United States, that's just a bunch of lone wolf nuts, and that gets downplayed. And Antifa can show up in large numbers in Portland, on the campus of Berkeley, in Charlottesville, and incite all sorts of violence. And they're responsible for clubbing and beating dozens of people and doing millions and millions of dollars worth of property damage. And is that... Now think about that in reverse. Imagine if there were white nationalist rallies occurring in the numbers that Antifa is. In other words, all over the United States, in large numbers, going on rampages, battling with the police, doing millions of dollars in property damage, and braining people with bike locks and the rest. Dozens and dozens of people. That really would be a story. Because, of course, it fits the narrative. The mainstream media out of New York, the left, would be going absolutely nuts that it's the rise of Hitler again in the United States. And yet... It's a bunch of communists and anarchists on the left, and it all just gets downplayed, barely covered, moved off of the front pages and the headlines within 12 hours. You know that these Antifa people are not buying their own plane tickets, 
and divvying up their own money to be protesting. So who's paying for all of this? The claim that George Soros is, I mean, this is a guy who's moved, what, something like 15, 18 billion of his own money into his open society foundation. So that's a tremendous amount of money. What that does is they give out all sorts of grants. And so it's a giant Cosa Nostra operation. I mean, it's a giant mafia because that money filters down into literally hundreds, if not thousands of organizations in communities all across America that have innocuous names and that you wouldn't necessarily know are funded by George Soros. And, and then it shows up as these organic, supposedly organic protests. Those are all funded. I would, I would suggest that the only organic protests that I have seen in the last couple of decades with the Tea Party, eventually yeah, that got a little organized, but very early on, the massive Tea Party protests were one of the very few examples of an actual grassroots organization. Having done public relations for a lot of my life, I can tell you that most of this stuff is highly organized and funded, especially on the left. I think some of the anti-Trump protests that kind of organically occurred in New York and some other places right after the election, those were probably just grassroots folks talking to each other, leftists who wanted to gather. But the stuff that occurred during the campaign against Trump, that was paid for and organized. We now have evidence out of Project Veritas that that, that was funded and paid for. And even things like the Women's March and all that, the pussy hats and all that bullcrap, that's all paid for and highly organized. So there are very, very few examples of spontaneous, organized, large protests in the United States. And, and this Antifa stuff is absolutely funded, absolutely got a source of funding behind it. The other day, Time Magazine published a series of articles attacking the Trump administration and uh, Carson Pruitt and DeVos especially, and it had this cover that showed these wrecking balls, and each of the wrecking balls looked like a Trump, an orange Trump figure. And the idea was that somehow they're aghast that Trump is taking a wrecking ball to the Washington government. And I, I saw that and I thought, you know, they are so blind that they actually think that's an attack. But there are literally millions of Americans who see that cover and that's like a celebration to them. Like he's taking a wrecking ball to Washington, D.C. This is, I mean, you, if you looked at that cover and you didn't know that Time magazine is far left now, Henry Luce must be absolutely spinning in his grave. You could probably electrify Detroit off of the energy created by him spinning in his grave because he was a very right of center guy and Time Magazine used to be very right of center but now it's extremely left. If you did not know that about Time Magazine and you just saw that magazine cover you would think that it was a celebratory write-up of the Trump administration and all the great work they're doing tearing the wiring out in DC. There are uh, this sexual assault scandal that started with Harvey Weinstein and has apparently opened the floodgates for every woman who feels like she was wronged by someone in Hollywood to come out and tell their story. It's interesting. They're, Breitbart is tracking this with an article where they're just keeping a list. They have up to 56 well-known bigwigs in Hollywood now who've been drawn into this scandal, probably most prominently Kevin Spacey and Dustin Hoffman. There's a number of key directors that have been drug into this, producers, studio executives, with women coming out and telling stories about inappropriate behavior. It runs the gamut, though. I mean, some of these stories are pretty heinous, especially the stuff around Weinstein. But in other cases, it's... I mean, you uh, George H.W. Bush was dragged into this, a 91-year-old man who's patting and young women on the behind when they're standing with for pictures with him inappropriate behavior by a guy who's got parkinson's i still say he can't reach any higher because he's in a wheelchair so you know some of the stories are it's interesting because the longer it goes on the less it's about like attempted rape and you know stuff that people would probably gen you know generally find you know be aghast at and now it's it's sort of inappropriate remarks or people feeling like uh, an a, a inappropriate joke was made or a sexual reference or a hug became a grope certainly and so what you, of course what you don't know in these stories of you know I was standing backstage and he grabbed my breast or he grabbed my behind is you don't know if there was any conversation that occurred if there was sexual banter that was going back and forth, if she had said anything 
in that conversation that if you'd heard it, say you heard the whole conversation wired, it might have explained why things escalated like that, that you're getting these stories completely out of context because you're just hearing her tell the story about what he did. And again, I'm sure a lot of it was inappropriate behavior, but I think as, we, as it goes on, it, becomes, it just turns into a free fire zone for a lot of people to settle scores. So what you're going to see mixed in there is disgruntled ex-girlfriends and others who it's just a, it's a chance to tell, you know, tell the story from my slant and he's a bad guy and a villain and he used me. You know, you're going to have situations, especially in this Hollywood atmosphere, where there was a quid pro quo where sex was being traded for career advancement. And then if... Someone feels like they didn't get what they were promised as far as career advancement, then they're going to feel like the sex that occurred was stolen or gotten under false pretenses. And then is that rape? And did the person take advantage of? So there's a lot of nuance in here that is, I don't know if that's going to come out or not. I can't say that I have a lot of sympathy for the people in Hollywood because they are almost primarily responsible for having created an atmosphere where these kinds of witch hunts can occur. A lot of these people were the first ones to encourage all of these attacks on Donald Trump over the Access Hollywood tape. And the behavior that's being described in all of this is far worse. So obviously the hypocrisy, there's karma involved in all this, and and I don't have really a lot of sympathy for all these leftists because as I've said before in previous podcasts, while I absolutely detest the mob. The one thing that I find to be somewhat cosmic justice is when people who have helped to create a mob are devoured by it. So let's talk about the scouts. Why do girls want to be allowed into Boy Scouts? Well, I've read a little bit about this announcement in which the Boy Scouts has said that they're going to allow girls in. I was somewhat startled because I thought the Mormons who have a lot of their children in the Scouts. I thought they had a pretty good hold on the Boy Scouts, but apparently the Scouts is kind of getting away from them. And I don't know whether the Mormons need to start their own organization or not, but the Boy Scouts is is sort of succumbing to one social justice warrior theme after another. And I don't know. I know that a lot of this is in response to declining membership, but I'm not sure whether this is going to increase or simply accelerate. You know, if your membership is declining... But the core of your membership are very conservative people. Suddenly making your organization more liberal is a huge risk because obviously the calculation is is that some of these liberals who've left it are, are going to bring their children back. But I don't think a lot of liberals are inclined to enroll their children in Boy Scouts because I don't think the basic themes of the Boy Scouts are of any interest to them. So what you end up doing is just further alienating the conservative base that you do have in your organization and driving them out. So I, I, I have very little faith that this is actually going to help the Boy Scouts in the long term. But from reading about this, it appears that the problem really is how badly the Girl Scouts are run because they're not meeting the needs of their members. I saw women talking about how that they supported this move because when they were in the Girl Scouts, there wasn't any opportunities to go camping or to do the kinds of things that the boys did. And then other women responded that their local Girl Scout troop did all that stuff. So what became clear is, is that it's really hit and miss all over the country whether or not the local Girl Scout troop that your daughter may be involved in actually will offer the kinds of things that the Boy Scouts do as well which I think is a criticism of the Girl Scouts, not the Boy Scouts. And then, of course, the Boy Scouts offers the Eagle Scout, something that the Girl Scouts don't have an equivalent for, and there are girls who want access to that because that's one of the leading ways of getting into the military academies, and it's one of the best things you can have on your resume, period. But again, I ask, why has the Girl Scouts not created an equivalent accomplishment like this for the girls? I, I just generally don't like this idea of everybody has to be in everybody else's club. And I get why women want into some of these things, but my question is, is why can't they start their own? We've had a lot of immigration waves. I was talking to Doris about this the other day. You know, when some Jewish people found themselves excluded from certain golf clubs, they responded by creating their own golf clubs. And there are now some very heavily predominant Jewish golf clubs in this country that are quite exclusive. And immigrant groups throughout American history have done the exact same thing. They've started their own community organizations when they felt like they were being iced out somewhere else. And these are important institutions in the country now. 
And I don't understand with women being half of the population why they're not able to start business organizations and the rest instead of having to get into every single male club. Why are women, you know, if this is an issue of women not helping women, because, you know, you want into these men's clubs because of the way the men in the clubs help each other out. And so, are, I mean, what I'm hearing is women saying that when they get into the men's club, they suddenly start getting a hand up and help that they weren't getting from a women's club. Why? why? This, again, rather than addressing the issue of why are women not creating clubs, why are powerful women and women in places of power not lowering their hand down and helping to create organizations that help other women up? I think the idea that people can't have exclusive clubs is ridiculous. People have, especially men and women, they have. there is something that comes from being in a men's club. And I know that women feel that they're that they want it you know the girls night out the idea that women together would like to have their own separate club that's not crazy talk either you know in 1984 the supreme court ruled that jc's uh must allow women into their membership and at that time there was both jc's for men and jcs for women and in my opinion it harmed the organization because jcs folded and only a few of those women became JCs. What good did that do? Then again, in 1987, they ruled against Rotary because Rotary had been forbidding women. Well, they've allowed ro women into Rotary, required to allow them into Rotary for some years now. And that's a business group, and it's a different situation. And I think that has been good to have an integrated club for Rotary. There's a general trend to homogenize in this country on a whole host of levels of over a course of many many topics there's just a general push to homogenize and one example of where that occurs is in this idea of masculinity and femininity there's a push uh it, at the same time women are pushing to have opportunities and to be allowed to fully participate in society which is perfectly noble and good there's also this push that women need to be less feminine or more like men one or the other or both and as i've said before the more that women insist on not being feminine that's going to create men who are not masculine exactly this androgyny that is sort of at the center of these sex-related culture wars that are going on. I, I don't see, first of all, that that's making men happy. It's this attack on toxic masculinity is basically a drive to encourage men to be less masculine. That's essentially what that's about. But at the same time, there's a tremendous push on women to be less feminine. And I don't see a future where women are happy with being less feminine or happy with the fact that the men around them are less masculine. And you can already see in the negative social statistics out there and suicide and alcoholism and all the rest that encouraging men to be less masculine and to live in a world in which women are less feminine is not making men happy. Of course, I get that no one cares in today's world whether men are happy, but I, I, my point is, is that it is also true that it is not making women happy, these two trends. And I think that as the world moves on, and I made this point to Doris the other night, you have a short-term and a long-term problem with this androgynous drive that's going on. The short-term problem is that this drive to make the men in your society less masculine is not happening equally across the planet. So in the Western societies, you are seeing men become less masculine at a much more rapid rate than the men in the non-Western societies. Now, if you have a problem with toxic masculinity and those kinds of things, you're going to, you're, and you're already seeing it with, again, when they import all of these men from the Middle East into Europe and then their rape statistics go up, it's because they have men in their own society who are not really capable or prepared to defend the women as much as they would have in the past. And the men you've imported have not adopted your social justice warrior outlook yet and they're bringing in pretty hard views about men and women when they come in so again this uneven application of this androgenization is going to create a lot of problems especially for women in the western world because 
some of the worst aspects of masculinity are going to come flooding in at you. Now, that's the short-term problem you have. The long-term problem, I think, is a reproduction problem because as you androgenize the culture over the course of 100 or 200 years, two things are going to happen. I think there's going to be a lot less sex between the sexes, which means there are going to be a lot fewer children and families and all the rest. People are going to retreat to technology and other things, and you're going to see a, a separation. There isn't going to be much interest in men hanging out with women if they're not feminine, and there certainly isn't going to be much interest in women hanging out with men if they're not masculine. So, you know, I have concerns about whether or not that actually, you know, where the species goes from there if, if people aren't even encouraged to reproduce. But I also, I don't see much of a happiness quotient in the future either. This future that we seem to be heading towards, this androgynous future in which men are less masculine and, and women are less feminine, I don't see a future there with a lot of people that are very happy. Yeah, this uh, whole nonstop assault on masculinity. You know, as one woman, I don't want my man to be a neutered lapdog. And, you know, then some of these women, they're going to wonder why they've created a bunch of Enochs. No doubt. No doubt. So... I wanted to talk about Stranger Things Season 2. That just got released on Net Netflix in the last week, and I did binge watch it. And my review of this is that for those of you, if you haven't checked out Stranger Things Season 1, I, I think I've talked about it on the podcast before, but I definitely en encourage people to check out that show. It's one of the best things on Netflix. I would say that Season 2 is good, not quite as good as Season 1, but totally watchable. I mean, anyone who's a fan of Season 1 is going to enjoy Season 2. The main problem, I main criticism, I guess I'd make, is it's a little slow out of the gate. It's 10 episodes, just like the first season, and I, the first five episodes, there's not a tremendous amount happening, and then the Stranger Things that you know and love kind of comes back very strong in episodes 6 through 10. So it ends very well. Second half's much better. Story arc's fine. I think, you know, they've set themselves up for a couple of seasons of interesting things happening. One of the things I really like about Stranger Things is this sort of dual achievement of recreating the 80s. And I've discussed this before, but They've done an excellent job of making you feel like it's taking place in the 80s. So the show takes place in the 80s, and the detail, the attention to detail, to costumes, hair, surroundings, it's all done very well. For anybody who lived in the 80s, it feels like it's, it's the 80s. But also, the production itself is done and executed in a way that the show feels like it was made in the 80s. It feels like... You're watching an old show from the 80s that takes place in the 80s. And that's the thing that they've accomplished, that sort of dual time travel accomplishment that I appreciate about, appreciate about the show. And that is down to the art direction and the folks who do the costumes and everything. It's extremely well executed in that way. And then they have a very good story, which is sort of, I don't know if I would really say that the show is a horror show. It, it does deal with kind of demonic and elements, I suppose, and it has some scares, but it's more of a suspense thriller, I would say. A little bit of a sci-fi suspense thriller. I guess if you think the Alien shows are horror show, horror movies, then it would qualify, but I think most people think of the Aliens movies as more like sci-fi suspense, and that's that's the genre that's, that Strange Things is in. Doris, you've been watching a few of the fall shows that have started up already. I think we had you were going to check out The Brave and uh, Valor and some of these other shows. Do you have a, a verdict on some of the shows? What did you start watching that you abandoned because it wasn't any good? The Brave and okay. Valor. Okay. Uh, I may still go back to watching the SEAL, SEAL Team one. Okay. Um, why do you why do you think you, you that one's still on the list? Because it didn't totally turn me off the one episode I did see. Okay. So I'm going to give that one another chance. Of course, my favorite is still This Is Us, and I'm still watching The Blacklist. Although The Blacklist sort of drifts anymore, I, it just it doesn't grasp me like it used to. Yeah, I mean, again, The Blacklist falls into this group of what I call the Alias shows because Alias started this trend of all of these shows where there's layers to the onion. There's some kind of conspiracy the person finds out about, and it's running the, the world. And the problem with the show is how do you stretch that out for seven 
seasons. You keep having to like peel back the layer and say there's a conspiracy within the conspiracy, and then there's a conspiracy within the conspiracy within that conspiracy, and then there's a conspiracy, you know, and it goes, and that's where the shows really begin to kind of come apart at the seams because you can't keep track of all of the twists and turns. And it become it moves into kind of absurd levels of how could this possibly work? This six layered conspiracy and the not only the double but the triple and the quadruple and the ten times double cross that's going on in these shows. And so Alias started out strong and just began to kind of unravel over time. And and there are a number of shows that have sort of done the same thing. And Blacklist is in that category of has a great idea and for the first season or two. That seems to be executing very well, and then as the onion continues, the layers of the onion keep getting peeled back, you just are starting to have kind of absurd fatigue, and you're losing track of, I often find, I know when Doris and I are talking about the show, we can't always remember who everyone is, or how many times somebody's been double-crossed. Oh, is that guy alive? I didn't even know he was still alive. You know, that's kind of the confusion you end up in these shows. Well, of course, uh, there's going to be no more House of Cards, even though they had started filming the next series uh, with Kevin um, Spacey. That's out. But um, Ray Donovan, which is something I really enjoy, finished their series for season. this season, season for yeah. this year. And he kills himself? Well, or he, does he? He just, jump, he just jumps, and the fact they have him landing in water tells you that they are not writing him out. He's perfectly alive, <laughs> although unconscious, at the end of the episode. So I, I doubt that they... I mean, obviously, they're coming back for another season. You know, I'm kind of lukewarm about Ray Donovan. This was a good show in the beginning. Um, I enjoyed it. Although I never loved the show, I did enjoy it in the beginning. And I think I kind of thought that things would grow on me and that this was a good show that could get better mm-hmm. as it went along. And instead, it's kind of done the opposite. It's a good show. It was never great. It was. It's a good show that's had trouble holding on to good over time and, and meandered. They had uh, a whole, this whole season, this last season has had the wife be back as a ghost. And they've done, uh, this is a, f- a feature of a lot of shows that annoys me where they want to edit out of sequence. So instead of showing you what happened in a linear fashion, they start with a scene and then suddenly you're back before that happened. Mm-hmm. And then maybe you're back to after that happened. And then maybe you're back to before it happened. And it can become confusing trying to figure out where you are in the timeline because the editor, and this is, they think they're being clever, is jumping all around as far as the order in which things have happened. And Bray Donovan is another show that sort of jumped into that. And I think it's a distraction. I, I think it's a sign of a lack of good ideas. If you have good story arcs, and entertaining characters, you don't need editing tricks like that that confuse and distract or somehow are supposed to impress the viewer. And I do think that Ray Donovan's been kind of wandering. Yeah, the only thing that keeps me really watching that is it's made me care about the characters, not just Ray, but his brothers. It's uh, good, good acting, I think, in that show. We're watching Poldark and Outlander, both of which continue to be excellent shows, very entertaining. What else is out there that we... uh... Well, just for something different, I tried the Canadian cooking contest. I've forgotten what it's called, the name of the show, but it's uh, it's the National Canadian Cook-Off kind of thing for for Canada's best cook. And that's been really different comparing it to how the American ones used to be. So that's been sort of interesting. Uh, Part of the competition involves having large groups of people come and they have to prepare a meal for them. And this past week, it was 200 bikers that were coming to lunch. And they had like an hour and a half to to prepare a meal for all these bikers. But I don't think it's something that's going to really keep my interest. Now, I watch Walking Dead. I know Doris does not, but... uh... The latest season has just started. There are a couple of episodes in. And I read that the ratings have dropped off for the show, which is interesting to me because I found the last couple of seasons to be a little bit slow, not quite as frantic as some of the early seasons. And yet I've been happy so far with this season that's just started. The pace has been, and the action has been more like the original show, you know, the original seasons. And so I'm a little surprised to hear that that the ratings are dropping off but uh, I mean, I still recommend 
for those, I mean, there's a huge fan base for The Walking Dead. I do not, do not recommend the spinoff show, Fear the Walking Dead. It is absolutely terrible. And it's forced me to sort of consider why I think The Walking Dead works and that one does, and this one doesn't. And, it's, and if you need any confirmation that characters matter, it's part of why we watch Ray Donovan is because we just like the characters. There are really no sympathetic characters in Fear the Walking Dead. And, and I find myself constantly thinking if the zombies walked in and ate each and every one of these characters right now, I wouldn't care. And I think what drives the fans in the original show is that we really do care about Rick and a number of other characters in that show. And we and are devastated when some of them get eaten. And so, uh, you know, the fact that you care about the show, you know, about the characters in the show, I think is really what drives it. So we were looking forward to seeing Suburbicon, but after reading reviews about that, man, I understand that that is a real mess. But I am looking forward now to seeing Murder of the Orient Express and see how that is, well, that is done or not. Yeah, Doris is trying to explain why we don't have a movie to report on this week, and it's because we've looked at what's playing and we have zero interest in even seeing it. Uh, so we're hoping that next week we'll have a movie to report on. We try to recommend, for those of you who do occasionally want to have a night out or a date night and, and go out to the movies, we're trying, we do this segment to give you some recommendations on movies to avoid or to go see. We like to be able to give a positive review to a movie, but since we basically test the waters once a week, if it's no good, we just got to tell you that so you can stay away from it. But that's that's essentially why we do that that piece, is to give you some recommendations and sort through most of the crap that is out in the theaters for the gems and encourage you to go see those. So, and part of the reason why we want you to go out and patronize those movies like Only the Brave that came out last week is that that's how we'll get more of them i mean if there's these good movies that come out as a, you know f infrequently as they do we that, that we need to patronize the theaters and see them because that's a signal to the movie studios to give us more of those types of movies so we are just about out of time you can find this episode and previous episodes if you just type into your podcast app or even on youtube the horrible deplorable show you can find it on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Podcast. This is a labor of love, but we need to grow, so I'm hoping that you will recommend this show to one other person. Trump supporters, you are not alone. Goodbye, Doris. Goodbye, Matt.